My name is Mary Rowe. Um, I'm with the Southern Illinois Workforce Development Board, and I'd like to welcome all of you here today. Uh, some of you are members of the Southern Illinois Workforce Development Board, the new that we're going to we change the name to the Southern Illinois Workforce Development Board as of today. And our Southern 14 friends, we'd like to welcome you and any other constituents that we have with us today. Uh, we are here today to uh, have this interactive uh, orientation with Melanie Arthur of the Gray Newton Associates, and Kathy will introduce her in just a few minutes. But why are we here today? We're here today because we represent our respective counties, and we're all dedicated to develop a workforce for our region. Uh, how can we do this? Well, I think simply, uh, in my opinion, we can do this to find out what our employers need. We have a golden opportunity with the New Workforce Investment Opportunities Act to develop policies and provide opportunities for training to enable willing workers to be job ready. This is the one thing I think that our employers in our area do need. We also can partner with and help promote economic development efforts in the region. We're not just workforce, and we're not just workforce training and workforce policies, but we also have to partner with uh, economic development. It has to go hand in hand. We can't do it alone. They can't do it alone. And we should always be engaged with our labor, our education, business, and public training agencies as we try to meet our goals. Uh, those of us who are on the board, especially for the Southern Illinois Workforce Development Board, we are representing our five counties. And we have a, a huge responsibility, in my opinion, that as we move forward, we have to become more active as a board. We definitely will become a policy-making board. And I think that Melanie, as she goes through this morning, she can help us guide, guide us and give us some, perhaps some uh, steps that we can take to become more actively engaged as board members. I think in the past we have relied so heavily on Kathy and her excellent staff at Mandricon, and they have provided us with the direction and the guidance that we have needed. But now we have to also step forward as board members, and that's why we're here today to learn how to do this. So without any further ado, if uh, Kathy is I want to also have Pam, uh, Mary, if you would, thank you so much. And Pam Barbie, want to stand, Pam, and talk okay. about Southern 14? Yay. Um, I'd just like to thank my board members for being here. Like I said, we represent the 14 Southern Rose counties. So please listen, learn, because like she said, I, you guys need to know as much as we do. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. And then just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have two restrooms right here off the kitchen. Um, and then we have some public restrooms down the hall. So when we all break, if these two restrooms aren't fast enough for you, we'll help you down the hall. There's some public restrooms down in the back. We have some food out in the hallway. Then we'll have lunch provided. And then for those who are staying for 1 o'clock, uh, and we're going to have a board meeting. And you guys are going to go, Southern 14, into the small conference room and have some activity between morning and afternoon. So um, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to all of our business members here. We know that you're giving up. Uh, uh, work, most of you work your businesses, and so thank you for being here with us uh, and all of our agency folks. It's really great. We have a regional plan we have to work on together. Doesn't mean anybody's trying to take over anybody else, it's just trying to figure out a way to share our resources so that we can uh, save the most money possible for our customers, both business and, uh, and uh, job seekers. And great to see Adult Ed here. Looking forward to that new relationship, increased relationship with both rehab. I think every one of our major partners are here. Excellent. Our colleges are here, Perkins. So I think we're in good shape, Melanie. So are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. All right. Thank you, Melanie Arthur. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody? Great. How's everybody else? <laughs> no coffee? You need your coffee? I am from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and we have coffee shops on every corner. So if you uh, notice my high energy, it has to do with, in part, my three cups of coffee already this morning. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me uh, start with a couple of kind of uh, a story and a little bit about context for the day. 
Um, we're going to be talking about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, but I think mostly today this is about context. It's really about the, the board, the board membership, and the board roles, and uh, as Mary said, really seizing an opportunity between a piece of legislation that was 15 years old, finally got uh, uh, upgraded and improved, and it creates this window of opportunity where I think there's some real magic that can happen to really ensure your economy is as regent and productive and competitive as possible. And that's kind of the goal. So I wanna, I wanna tell a little bit of a story about Sir Christopher Wren. Um, and if you know, he was an architect uh, in, in England in the late 1950s, uh, 1660s. And he's credited uh, mostly with uh, rebuilding all of the cathedrals in London after the Great Fire in 1666. Um, so he's an architect, and as the story goes, he walked down to a work site one day where there was a large, very large group of workers, and they were all doing the exact same thing. So a big group of workers all doing the, the same thing. And he walked up to one of the workers and he asked the, the, the tradesperson, what are you doing? And the response was, I'm cutting stone. And uh, Sir Ren sort of took that inside and kept looking, and he walked up to another worker and he asked the second worker, what are you doing? And the second worker said, I'm cutting a foundation block. We're building a foundation. And he took that in stride and kind of reflected on it. And then he found a third worker and he walked up to the third worker. Again, all workers were doing the exact same thing. And he said, what are you doing? And the third worker looked up and stood up and said, I'm building a cathedral. I'm building a cathedral. So three very different responses, yes? And three different outlooks on life, three different senses of value for what I have, what I'm doing with my time. So I think as a board, we have all three of those roles as core. We really have to look at all of the individual tasks and the individual pieces of operation. And we really have to continue to build a strong foundation and expand it. This uh, piece of legislation is really taking our, our foundation and spreading it farther across our, our region and our communities. But the third one is probably the most important for the board, is to really keep your eye on the prize. Really keep your eye on your regional economy and how it is that we make it as productive and competitive as possible, given our resources, given our realities, and then have some vision for it too. Really see that cathedral and that regional economy thriving, and have that be really what, what, what guides your work. So we're going to, uh, and I have, we do have some handouts. Let me just tell you a little bit about the handouts. So I'm the kind of presenter that likes to address kind of the people who just want the executive summary, and the people who really want to know what the details are. So I tend to put a lot of information in my PowerPoints. I'm not the, you know, five words per slide kind of presenter. So what we're handing out to you is, is primarily a resource guide, and there are several slides in there that we're gonna spend some time on today, but you will see me. So for those of you who like all the details and are gonna get a little anxious about all the slides I'm skipping forward, we're gonna have some follow-up opportunity to really drill down on the details. But we really wanted to keep kind of the conversation at the macro level today. So here are some handouts for you. All right, so before I get started, I want everybody to stand up. This is the interactive part. <laughs> let, let, let's make it interactive. All right, cross your arms. Now cross them the other way. All right, hold them there. Cross them the other way. All right, if you are a new board member, sit down. All right, so the job, are you uncomfortable? It's a little weird, right? It's a little awkward. Yes? 
Yes. Okay, so think about your new board members. Brand new, here today going, cool, workforce board. <laughs> or what have I got myself into? In any, case, in any case, it's not a place of knowledge, it's not a place of comfort yet, right? So let's adopt them, let's mentor them, let's make sure they get comfortable and productive as board members as soon as possible. So just keep that kind of, oh, what if this is my first day in this arena? What would it feel like? All right, that's all. Sit back down, shake it out. Get yourself comfortable. Yeah. And, and adopt a new member. Make sure they have mentors, access to information. I think one of the challenges as a board member, in terms of being productive, not coming to a meeting and being, how many, I had my, my, one of my grandmother's head in the back of her car, um, a little dog with a bobblehead. So what we don't want, what we want to make sure we avoid is board members who don't feel knowledgeable enough uh, and have context and are therefore unable to make a substantial contribution. And I'm sure this doesn't happen anywhere in the beautiful area of Southern Illinois. But I go to a lot of meetings and I see those little dogs that are in the back of my grandmother's car. <laughs> I, I, nay, I, nay, I, say nay, I, 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 yeah, whatever. <laughs> and we really don't want that. We really need something a lot more substantial. So here, here's, a, here's the main sort of agenda today. We want to recognize and explore especially the business members' involvement on a local board. And we want to find ways to optimize and maximize that. What, one of the main things this piece of legislation does is it reaffirms that economic development and workforce development must have the guidance and leadership of the business community in order for it to be relevant, in order for it to be on point. We must have the business community's participation and involvement. So beyond what the legislation and the regulation says about your functions, we really want to talk about your roles and more important, have you thinking about what is my contribution? What is my contribution as an individual board member? What is my contribution for making sure that the business membership on the board is active and participating, feels comfortable, really gets involved, stays committed. Uh, we want to explore your value. What value is it to be on this board? Um, and really find, start to find, talk about ways that maybe the Workforce Investment Act can help your business if you're a business member. Uh, advance, succeed, become more productive and more competitive around your human resource challenges specifically. So my goals are to limit the government speak I get to throw something at me if I start talking in a language that sounds so foreign that you're, you're not able to follow me, but hopefully that won't happen. And I want, to, I want to make it real for you. I want you to have the answer to the question, what did I get myself into? I want you to start figuring out what are the ways in which I can make a contribution to this cathedral that we're building in Southern <coughs> Um, and a little bit maybe to share my passion. I think that uh, if I wasn't a consultant traveling all over the country all of the time, I would want to be on my local workforce development board. I think this is some of the most important work in relationship to where you sit within your economy. Where you sit within your economy. I was talking about an economic development. You can't just bring jobs in if you don't <coughs> have the workers. You can't just bring jobs in if you don't have the right workers. You can't train the workers if there's no jobs. So right in the middle of all that kind of complexity is a workforce development board that with good contribution, good business leadership, good participation and commitment can really make a difference. So my passion, my vision is every employer has easy access to hire or develop the exact worker he or she needs. Every employer has easy access to hire or develop the worker they need. Can we do that? It's a vision, it's not a reality. <laughs> I, I, I have been told I live in a fantasy world. But we gotta make progress toward that or, or we're not a good workforce development board, would you agree? That, that is really what it's all about. 
So for example, do you like sarcasm? Raise your hand if you like sarcasm. I, raise your hand, hold up. I need to know how much I can how much I how much I can go there. Excellent, excellent. You know, you know, I'm I'm from Boston and there's still a culture of we came to be left alone. So sarcasm is it's not even second nature, it's it's just who we are. It's just who we are. So um, I haven't told I have a fantasy vision, but I think a vision is what really motivates you. So have that cathedral and that vision in mind, and then we'll proceed. Uh, a couple more details about uh, our context for today. So as you progress, just for those of you who are going to start to attend board meetings, and you hear people say, well, it's Title IV, Title IV-B, or Title IIA, B, Section 107. When we start to go there, we have a little cheat sheet. So it's not exactly a glossary, but essentially the piece of legislation is organized into five chapters. And each chapter essentially covers a core program, and the first title also covers the system. And we'll talk about more about what a system is. So here's uh, some description of the themes and the general objectives in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So we will really want to focus on our partnerships and make them more functional, make them more active, make them not names on a list of board members. So really functional partnerships, increasing the alignment across. So those foundation stones that we're building, we have to add more to the picture. We have to kind of go out and get deeper and cover bigger resources and cover bigger programs. Uh, one of the main things that I think is really different in the workforce development system in their piece of legislation is it recognizes that our economies are more regional than local. Employers are more regional than local. Right? They, 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 they see their customer base in wider areas than the lines used on our map to draw a local workforce investment area. They hire from bigger areas sometimes than we see on our local workforce investment area map. So they've added this piece about being regional, thinking regional, and operating regionally in order to benefit the region. So what floats the whole boat will be more common in your discussion and more common in your work, and in particular for these two boards, because you are in a region together. Did you know all that? Did you all know that? <laughs> you did, yes? Mm -hmm. So they looked at not local workforce investment areas to create uh, planning groups. And the way they did this is they took Illinois' 11 economic development regions. And these two boards are in a region together. So there'll be a lot more opportunity to figure out how to maximize our resources and float the boat in a bigger way. All right, so I'm going to have us do another little exercise. Bring on your own. And then after you have an answer, compare your answer to other colleagues at your table. at your table if you haven't yet and tell each other how you got your number.
When you're done, put your head down on the table in front of you. Can we salute? I'm totally kidding. That was sister, that was sister Mary Catherine. Sorry, she comes out every once in a while. Do you have your number two pencil? They were just about over that. They were just about over that ruler business. I got two different answers. Two, two. One, my my literal kind of mean spirited answer was they're all rectangles, so there's no square. <laughs> they're supposed to be square. Well, yeah. So so the so, other So your right brain said what? So this is what we deal with. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we. By the way, by the way, we do want three. both brains in the room. Okay. Okay. So what I was your second? Thirty. Yeah. Anybody else? Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Oh, wrong. Wow. <laughs> Everybody else there? I only got 26. 26. How about here? 26. Back there, 26. All right, I think we should have the 32 table to show us how they got to 32. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. All right, so with the magic marker, can you come show us the 32 boxes, squares? <laughs> we need a volunteer. You're on the pier. pier. You're on the board, get used to this. We need a volunteer. I know, I'm just I'm telling everybody else. You get used to it. All right, take one of the markers and just draw us your 32 squares. First of all, the obvious. So there's one, there's one four by four. Can I use my notes? Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> one, one four by four boxes. Then you've got four by four, 16. 16 one by one boxes. Up then to 17. You've got one in the center. So now we're going two by twos. There's one. Now, let's see. You've got one, two, three, four. Four more two by twos. Then you've got let's see, one, two, three, four. Wasn't that the same thing? All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then we've got one. Three by three by threes. Three by three. One, two, three, three, four. Four. Yep. That four is still good. Now, that's, uh, see. 16 one by ones, nine two by twos. So, one, right. two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine two by twos. Nine two by twos. Four, three by threes. And, and one total box. One total box. And that gives seventeen, eighteen, and eight. Twenty-six. We, 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 we got to thirty. We just 30. what I just did. Yeah. <laughs> I got thirty-one. And it's Close to a question I heard Chris ask. It's not the paper. Oh, John, for being brave. I mean, I There's a thank you, John. We appreciate your contribution. There's one more square. So when my daughter was young, she watched the Olympics. She was about three, and she really liked the um, the, the tumbling, the gymnastics. But with three, you can't even do a forward roll. But she thought she was a gymnastics. So after the Olympics, 
she would find anything that looked like a runway, so airplane, <coughs> aisles, she spent a lot of time with me in the airport, who's church. She would think this was an opportunity for her, her gymnastics. <laughs> and she would go. So her nickname is Tricky. She learned to ride a bike that way too. <laughs> And, I, and the car driving, okay. So, being tricky, there's one more story. Oh. Oh. Tricky. Oh. So, I use that word a lot. It's tricky. You, you can picture this now whenever you hear me say the word tricky. And it's really a lot in the face. So, keep that in mind. All right, so what do we just do here? Besides, kind of an interesting, fun little side game. <laughs> So back 15 years ago, here was the theme. Well, there's 142 different workforce programs out there, or so. I mean, everybody had a different panel. And they're not even on the same page. They don't look like this at all. So with WIA, we started to see this. We started to see at least all the publicly funded workforce investment opportunities connect themselves connect themselves. And then we would get special projects or grants or an opportunity to plan with each other. And we'd have to really see the whole box with the 16 squares, right? And now we've really moved into a point where we've got to see the three by threes, education, labor, business, youth, unemployment insurance, the welfare programs. We've got to see the three by threes and understand how to connect them and align them on the same path as our regional and local plan, right? We can't see just the 16 boxes as one entity or the 16 individual boxes as entities. Regional planning is going to require a lot more of that. So who's at the table? What is their contribution? <coughs> what do they need to get in order to make that valuable contribution? It becomes a much more comprehensive conversation. And I will tell you a couple of things. I love being in the Pacific Northwest. But people think of their pace as very slow. The point is that when you collaborate and when you want consensus, it takes time. Would you agree? Yes. It takes a lot of dialogue from everybody in all of the boxes. Or you move forward without something that's going to look like this. So in my mind, it's a Rubik's Cube. It's not this flat 16. It's a Rubik's Cube. And your board job is to keep shifting the pieces around so that you find the right components for each opportunity. So for planning, there's going to be a unified state plan. There's going to be 10 regional plans. And there's going to be 26 local plans. But they have to be connected. And they have to mesh together in order for the, the whole boat called Illinois to really float. Would you agree? So I might come to you in this box but I have to be learning about, valuing, and seeing that this box won't get very far by itself without kind of making better connections and really more vibrant partnerships, much more vibrant partnerships. So if you're a business member, we really need your independent business experience, what you do as your business job. We need your representation of businesses like yours. Your representation. Businesses like mine have these needs, have these issues. And we need you to be a representative of the whole business community on the board. Or one of the challenges that I think workforce boards will have is they'll keep doing this without the blue side of the cube. The blue side of the cube is business. We might get the yellow, all the government programs, and the green, all the labor side, labor organizations and workers. 
but we really got to see the whole dynamic. That's kind of two different analogies of cathedral and a Rubik's cube. But it's really seeing that whole picture and looking for the connections. So as you think about your role, it's how do I participate in one of these opportunities to create better alignment around a regional and a local plan? How do I help make what we have all decided is important for our region or our local area? How do I make that happen? What is my particular contribution? Okay, so let's just look a little bit more. <coughs> So uh, another big theme within the Workforce Investment Act is building blocks, strategic building blocks. So over the last 15 years, we've learned a lot about some pretty common strategies that are working. And now those strategies have been embedded in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and you will re be required to use those strategies. You'll be required to have them in your regional plan, and you'll be required to have them in your local plan. And three of the key strategies I want to highlight are sector partnerships, write these down, sector partnerships, career pathways, and work-based learning. Sector partnerships, career pathways, and work-based learning. So sector partnerships are, are when you take a group of businesses that share suppliers, employers, productivity and competitive <coughs> issues, and you put them together and you address their key issues. What is the biggest problems we're having in healthcare? Right? So healthcare is not an industry, services is the industry. They're a subdivision. And in the healthcare sector, you might talk about the nurses, but you've got to talk about the nurse teachers. Right? Right now, nurses isn't in the, one of the demand, one of the highest, it's not on the list anymore, it used to be for years, of occupations hard to fill. What is now higher on that list is teaching nurses. So if I'm thinking of a sector, I have to look at my little cutting, cutting project see the foundation stones, and put a whole bunch of boxes together to solve that problem. Because if you're not trying to create, if you're trying to create more nurses, what do you have to do? Have more nurses become teachers. Now, do you think all, all nurses could just be natural teachers? I, I'm in areas all over the country where their healthcare sector built a lot more training and have waiting lists of people in slots that are available and paid for and don't have any teachers. Okay, well that sector initiative missed a key box, would you agree? Missed a foundation stone. Okay, so sectors are really how I float the whole boat. I might have to think about all the workers in a hospital, not just the medical workers. I might have to think about whether or not the drivers are bringing the clean linen to the hospital. And the cashiers are in the cafeteria, right? So a sector is really looking really broadly at a Rubik's Cube for a particular group of related businesses and their occupations and coming up with some solutions that marshal the public workforce investment and align it. So in adult ed, we want you focusing on soft skills in the healthcare profession. And in uh, GED, we want a little more contextual to the Medicare, to the medical. You know what I mean? You just start sort of spamming that out and really saying how you can do some alignment. Career pathways, is there a difference between a job and a career? This is a good bobblehead. You can go ahead and <laughs> you just go ahead and bobblehead for me. I do like audience participation, by the way, and this counts. What's the difference between a job and a career? I, I ask easy questions. There's no setup. There's, there's nothing tricky. Well, well, with today's generation, a job you'll have for a year and a career you'll have for five. <laughs> 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 or several jobs together. What, did everybody hear that? <laughs> how many? How many people have teenagers? Young, young twenties. 
Uh, you know, the Gen X stuff doesn't even apply. The millennials are just so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so a job is maybe an event, and a career is maybe kind of stringing something together for a couple, multiple years. What else is the difference between a job and a career? Well, you don't get a career that have passion. You hope if they find a career, no matter what job in that pathway, they have passion for it. Yeah. I was just going to say identifying with what you do is a part of who you are. Whereas right. a job is like, oh, hey, I got a job at McDonald's for the summer. Right. So let me do another, <clears throat> this is another biblical analogy. So teach them to fish or give them a fishing pole. Well, sometimes you have to teach them. I mean, sometimes you have to have a job before you have a career, right? Or, for example, here's something that the local, most of the local workforce development centers, because of their shortage of staff and their enormous amount of administrative activity <coughs> and the challenges of the performance measures, don't do something called career exploration anymore. We sort of do it in the high school, but not really. And unfortunately, most high school guidance counselors are still really pressured for those college entrants when skilled tradesman is on the top of the hardest job to fill in, in the Americas, right? So just like, yes. Yeah. Well, one thing we face today that, we, that we're facing that other generations haven't faced is the fact that there are no true careers anymore. A career. <clears throat> There's not, jobs don't last, and careers don't last long enough for uh, 40 years. Right. It changes. Right. Well, and the job changes when you're in it. Everything's a lot more dynamic, I would agree. But for a customer to understand the difference between a job and a career pathway is when they're in our purview and under our advising and counseling and guidance, getting them to think about not what job are you going to get next, but what are the next four or five jobs that you might be working toward in each of these? And what education should you pursue while you're working so that you can advance without the cycle called job, unemployment, school without a job, job, unemployment, school without a job. We can't do that anymore, would you agree? We, we, don't, we, we can't afford it, and they can't afford it. So how do we help them see this job leads to this job with this kind of education and training, leads to this job with a little bit more work experience, leads to. So I'm working on this great project in, in Rhode Island. It's called On Ramps, and we're really focusing on kind of putting people from wherever they are, the first job, re-entering the labor force, long-term unemployed, for example, dislocated workers. And, and the first thing we ask in the orientation, what's the difference between a job and a career? And which would you rather have? What do you think the answer is? Job. Interestingly enough, because I hear this from frontline workers all the time, all they want is a job when they come in. They don't want career exploration, Melanie. They want a job. Well, if I'm offering you five jobs for the next five years, or one job that'll end in one year, which would you prefer? five consecutive years with the paychecks, or random one job, one paycheck opportunity, which would you prefer? Okay, so they're easy to get them thinking more long term than I thought it would be, especially when I let the frontline workers say, all they want is a job, and they want me to write the resume, that's all they want. Okay, so if we step back, we're doing more career exploration, we're doing more career planning, we're giving them tools that show them career pathways and I think making a very significant difference. So, and then work-based training which is the third big, I think, opportunity. So this is another question that if I just had the employers in the room ask to answer this question. What's better, send someone who's not working off to school for six months or send them to you and you train them while they're on the pay payroll? If you had to pick, option two. By the way, just so my publicly, my public workforce development friends get this, okay, so most employers combined spend more money on training workers than you have in a five-year budget. The trainers 
of most of the workforce are employers. I'm going to stop and I'm going to say it again. Most of the workforce training is delivered by employers. And it's not just the tuition reimbursement funds. Every hire gets training. Every promotion gets training. Every new production line <coughs> leads to training. Every skill gap causes there to be training on the job. And most of the training is happening with workers, not people who are unemployed. The Workforce Investment Act, uh, Opportunity Act, gives you the opportunity to be more significant in work-based learning opportunities. So why can't this youth get a job they don't have any work experience? Well, they need work experience. They need to either have a job where they're learning about work, job shadowing, or they need to have a job where they're learning a job, work experience, in you know, controlled situations. This is the dynamic in the, in the legislation that I think most calls on the business community. We need to help people tap into your training with our support, our funds, our guidance, our, uh, our, our you know, curriculum. But we need to help you be better trainers in addition to working with the people who are unemployed or youth or long-term or transitioning from one job to the other. So I think that's one of the most significant changes in this legislation. Sector strategies, career pathways, and work-based learning is at an all-time high. All right, so uh, again, they repeat, this was in WI, but they repeat that we want to use data to drive our decisions. Uh, I would do that at a board every time. Let's not have opinions here. What's the data say? That's a good idea, let's get some data so that we can turn that idea into a relevant project. Emphasize training, I talked about this one, skills gain, and credentials. We really want to say this training was meaningful. Uh, increase and in measure employer engagement, some funding flexibility, and there's a, a, a refocus on some of the target populations. Um, and they've not, not been part of the community of the public workforce development world, but they're restated. And I can't tell you how many times it says, help individuals, comma, including people with disabilities. I mean, every time it sort of uses the word customer, it says including people with disabilities. I mean, it's a really clear, targeted focus for this population that's most likely left out of the workforce mainstream. All right, so that's kind of some of the highlights there. Any questions? Yes? One of the things that I've, I've often thought was, you know, trying to help somebody through a career, and signing a career that I've never really heard anybody take a look at is, is working with the client, asking what their lifestyle is that they want. Because a lot of people don't necessarily want to work all the time, but they have other things that are more of a priority, so we're trying to send them to a 40-hour uh, or a 50 hour job because that's what's available and that's what's good, but they may have kids that they would prefer to be, be at home with or, or balancing those kinds of needs. And I, haven't, I haven't seen as part of any of the career analysis I've ever done, you know, starting with that kind of lifestyle survey, you know, or new cars and vacations important to you. I mean, which kind of things that really get at determining how much money versus time, you know, you know how, how you would do that because certain careers, as far as you get in them, they might not ever give you the lifestyle that you want. So right. uh, if you push them down that path, they'll never be happy. Right. Well, I think there is there is a bigger trend, and I think as we work with the Gen X and the Millennials, you know, that's you have to be involved in kind of a, a more whole person approach. But I always I always laugh. Like in California, you just work enough to take a six month vacation, and then you work enough to take a two month vacation, and then you work enough, you know surf, sail, or pick grapes. <laughs> or drink grapes. <laughs> or, 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 <laughs> take the wine making class. I mean, they really, they're, they're, so your economies drive the answer to that question. There are generalities, and they're definitely becoming more and more generalities among the different age groups. So it has to be a little bit of a more, even if you're a parent saying, no, you will get a full-time job. You are not living with me. <laughs> no, no. Oh, and then if you are, you're going to pay to build the apartment on the garage and you're going to pay to live it. 
<laughs> but there is that dynamic, and I think more and more we're getting to see how to incorporate that into planning your future, which includes, for us, work. How much, what kind, what's a, there, there's a program for youth that's been around for a long time. It's called The Real Game. And what it does, it's, a, it's an online program. You go online and you pick the kind of vacations you want, the kind of car you want, the kind of house you want, how many kids you think you're going to have. Right? So you just sort of put your little life together. And then they translate it to a dollar amount. So, you know, by like 28, you want, you want to be making this much money. Here's some careers that pay that amount. Here's how much education you have to get to get one of those careers to make that amount to buy all those things. And so it's, it's a fascinating way to do, to do both, get them a little bit more realistic and to get us thinking, all right, if you can do it, <coughs> you're really motivated for that. We're going to help you build the path. Okay, any other questions? So let me just say one thing about the regulations. Who's read them? Kathy. That's sad. That's sad. They're uh, combined about 1,600 pages of stuff. But within, within the theme that I'm talking about, within the theme that I'm talking about here, one of the things they've done much more clearly this time is they said the community of, of individuals in the programs for vocational rehabilitation, the community of individuals in the programs for adult education, and that includes GED and English as a second language and citizenship and um, you know, getting, getting enough skills so that I can be successful as a student in college, that kind of group. Uh, Ragnar Paisa program, which is really about um, labor exchange and jobs, it's run by IDS. Um, and the Adult Dislocated Worker and Youth Program, which is specifically under the purview of the board. Those six programs will have one plan at the state level. They will have one plan at the regional level and they will have a coordinated plan at the local level. And all of those programs have the exact same performance measure now. It's shocking, and it will be very fascinating, so people are fascinated to see it happen. But they're saying this red line is not dotted anymore. You will work together to align and organize and address your regional and local economy. <clears throat> okay. So well, let me just talk a little bit about, uh, start to talk a little bit about board and leadership roles. So I want to give you, um, again, more context, more context to understanding kind of where we are today and how boards have evolved and where we're really going. So does anybody have cats? Who's cats at home? Okay, so do you have a laser? Oh, you have to get a laser. Oh, this is hours of fun for you and your cat. <laughs> they don't stop. Up and down the wall, keep jumping and jumping. I mean, they don't stop. It's like a drug. 